Good morning, everybody, and welcome. If I could get the people in the auditorium to uh, take your seats. And uh, those of you who are watching this at your computers, you could do whatever you like because we can't see you. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome. It is my very great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Rajendra Pachari, who is the director of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a position that he has held since 2002. Uh, I'm not going to read his biography, which is very long and extensive. I'll just mention that he was educated both in India and in the United States, that he has degrees in industrial engineering and in economics, and has taught at the university level uh, in several different capacities, uh, both in the areas of applied research and in resource economics. Uh, I will share just one uh, very brief observation, which is that um, I uh, first heard about Dr. Pachari when he assumed the position in 2002, and among my friends in the um, environmental advocacy world, there was a lot of skepticism about this guy with his business background and whether he was going to be so conservative that the IPCC would back away from um, taking strong positions on climate science. I think history has shown that he steered that panel uh, in the direction of making some very profound findings about this issue, and um, the world is going to be a better place as a result of it. So uh, without further ado, I am going to let uh, Dr. Pachari come to the microphone and begin his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson Nichols. It's a great privilege to be here and uh, to get this opportunity at a particularly opportune moment when uh, the government has uh, drafted its scoping plan, which I'm sure is going to be the forerunner of many actions and initiatives that would really tackle the problem of climate change, not only in California, but perhaps set an example to other regions of the world and, and the states of the U.S. in uh, following suit. Uh, <clears throat> I'm essentially going to focus on the key findings from the IPCC fourth assessment report and I'm glad that you referred to the time when I was <clears throat> elected as chairperson of the IPCC. Uh, there was indeed a great deal of skepticism, skepticism because uh, my two predecessors, for whom I have a great deal of respect, were uh, atmospheric scientists, and I certainly wasn't. But on the other hand, if you look at the entire chain of cause and effect, then uh, climate change, of course, consists of this very essential part of atmospheric sciences, where you've got to come up with a scientific assessment of how climate change is going to evolve, and what would be the nature of changes that's going to take place. But on the other hand, if you go further downstream, you've got to understand the impacts, not only in geophysical terms, but in social and economic terms. How is climate change going to impact on different ecosystems, different social systems, and all living things on this planet? And then if you start looking for solutions, in terms of mitigation opportunities, then you have to look at technology, you've got to look at economic choices, and all of that, may I say, goes far beyond atmospheric sciences. So I want to emphasize the fact that the assessment of climate change is very much a multidisciplinary enterprise. And if you view it from a narrow perspective, then I think you're missing out on some dimensions which are absolutely critical. Anyway, what I'm going to do is quickly run through some important findings of the fourth assessment report and to preface my presentation with uh, some facts. This is a pretty large scientific undertaking and I must say the IPCC in that sense is a unique species. There really is no other uh, initiative similar to the IPCC because we mobilize the best experts and scientists from all over the world. And these are persons who devote their time, their knowledge, and their hard work uh, 
for no payment at all from the IPCC. It's essentially a dedication to the importance of the task that they are undertaking. And in the fourth assessment report, the total number of persons who actually wrote the report was about 450 people. But over and above that, we had what is known as 800 uh, contributing authors. And these are essentially experts who write on a very specific topic and submit their uh, contributions to the core writing team, if I could call it that. Uh, over and above that, we had over 2,500 expert reviewers because at each stage of the drafting, uh, <clears throat> whatever we produce has to be reviewed by expert reviewers. And each comment that they provide has to be carefully logged. The authors that are writing the reports look at these comments and if they are accepted, then that's clearly recorded. If they are not accepted, then you have to write down the reasons why they were not accepted. So it's an extremely transparent process. And it's open to scrutiny from a very wide section of society, including all the governments of the world, because the final draft is also commented on by governments. And their comment, comments are taken on board just as I described to you a minute ago. Uh, this is only a preface to tell you about how the IPCC functions, but um, uh, I'll quickly go through the history of climate change, and all of you, I'm sure, are aware of this. Uh, the science of climate change is not something that's new. It was highlighted well over 100 years ago by a Swedish scientist, Arrhenius, who incidentally won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Uh, and there were several other scientists subsequently who raised concerns and in some cases an alarm about the effect of greater and greater consumption of fossil fuels, which would increase the concentration of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, and that this in turn would affect the climate of the Earth. Things came to a head in 1988 when there was a huge... Uh, drought in North America and very high temperatures. And that's when the U.S. Congress decided to look at this issue in some depth. And James Hansen, who I'm sure you've heard about, was uh, one major witness who informed the U.S. Congress about the seriousness of the problem and how it might really have even more serious impacts in the future. There was worldwide concern, and in 1988, the IPCC was established through a resolution of the UN General Assembly, and it was set up by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. In 1992, uh, the, the first assessment report of the IPCC had a major impact in the formulation and drafting of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. In 1997 came the Kyoto Protocol, and 2005, uh, was at that stage the warmest year since record keeping began in the mid 19th century. And that's also the date when the Kyoto Protocol finally got ratified with the exclusion of the US, of course, but that requirement of the uh, number of countries that were, that were essential to the ratification was completed and therefore the Kyoto Protocol took effect. And as I mentioned, the IPCC is guided by the mandate given to it by its parent organizations. And its role is to assess on a comprehensive, objective, and totally transparent basis, as I described, the scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information, the whole range of these issues on climate change. Uh, and as I mentioned, the first assessment report had a major impact in defining the content of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The second assessment report had influenced in the provisions of the Kyoto Protocol. And the third assessment report uh, <clears throat> focused attention on the problems of impacts of climate change and the need for adaptation. And the fourth report, which came out last year, I think has provided a substantial basis through informing the public and the leadership across the world of what needs to be done in the next stage of an agreement at the global level, which one hopes will come into existence by the end of 2009. Um.
And one major uh, lesson that one can get is to show that science can help address problems facing humanity, particularly where they are characterized by a huge amount of uncertainty and complexity. We believe that the IPCC has created knowledge and understanding of the complex interrelationships between human actions and the environment. And by defining specific solutions and assessing the options available, then it can also address the problem if it's applied on a large scale. Now, one major finding that we had in the fourth assessment report was the fact that we stated that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. There really is no basis anymore for doubting the scientific reasons for the warming of the Earth. And if you look at this diagram, which charts changes in surface temperature since the beginning of industrialization, you would see that, as is inevitable, there are ups and downs in this particular track. And that's the result of both human as well as natural causes. There's solar activity, volcanic activity, which has a tendency to bring about uh, cooling rather than warming. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at the last few decades, then clearly temperature increases have been sharply uh, higher than what you see in previous periods. And if we were to draw a line through the last 100 years record, you find that overall the increase in temperature during that 100 year period, that's essentially during the 20th century, has been 0 0.74 degrees Celsius, which is at a rate of 0 0.074 per decade. But on the other hand, if you look at the last 50 years, then that's been much sharper. You see in the last 50 years, the increase has been at almost twice the rate of what you had in the total 100 year period. Um, and we know that 11 of the last 12 years rank among the 12 warmest years in the instrumental record of global surface temperature. So it's not theory, it's not something that's pulled out of the air. This is based on hard evidence coming from observations of which we have a record. The causes of change, you know, often people come out with uh, opinions that the, there are a whole range of factors that are induced by nature, which is causing this change, and scientists really don't know what they're talking about well. Here we have a plot of observations, as you can see over here. Uh, and if we look at the effect on the climate using models that have an input only of natural forcing, you know, natural factors that, as I mentioned, would be largely solar activity and uh, volcanic activity, then you get this blue band, which uh, clearly based on the outputs of the models that are being used, show you the path that would have been undertaken only by this set of changes. On the other hand, if you look at uh, model outputs where, which use both natural as well as human-induced forcing, then you get a path which very closely corresponds with actual observation. So what I want to do is to emphasize the fact that I think today we have reached a level of expertise in modeling of climate change by which we can clearly separate out the effects of human as well as natural factors. And we have validated the outputs of these models with actual observations, uh, which again leaves no room for doubt. What are the other changes that are taking place as a result of climate change? Heat waves have become more frequent over most land areas. And this is a serious hazard because in 2003, you might remember, there was a terrible heat wave in Europe centered particularly around Paris and that region. And altogether, 35,000 deaths took place. And there are other parts of the world where these heat waves take place and often are not even noticed. There was a part of India in 2003 which had a heat wave lasting 27 days. Typically, those heat wave conditions last about seven days at the most, from two to seven days, but this was one occasion when it lasted almost a month. And as a result, there were several deaths that took place. Intense tropical cyclone activities increased in the North Atlantic since about 1970. And, you know, one doesn't want to quote the examples of hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma, uh, but 
there is some indication that the intensity of these cyclones has increased in recent decades. There is also more intense and longer droughts that have been observed over wider areas since the 1970s. About 25 percent of Africa's population currently experience high water stress. And here I do not have to remind you of what is likely when you have drought, when you have high temperature, uh, forest fires break out. Uh, in Australia there was a prolonged drought for six years and they had a menace with forest fires every year. Uh, and actually that affected the political outcome in the last election. The Australian election had a major concern related to climate change and those forest fires were also lit, if I may say, under the seat of the last Prime Minister and he had to, he had to lose, the, he lost the election despite the fact that Australia overall had an uh, economic boom of sorts going on largely because of uh, increased export of uh, metals, minerals and, uh, and hydrocarbons. Uh, so uh, I believe that there is no uh, escape from the impacts of climate change and the effects that it would have on society and uh, on politics in several parts of the world. If you look at the impacts of climate change, well first let me uh, present to you our projections of increase in temperatures. Uh, if nothing is done to mitigate the emissions of greenhouse gases, then what we find on the basis of scenarios that the IPCC has employed and has assessed, uh, we get a whole range of temperature increases by the end of the century and uh, we get at the lower end of the spectrum the best estimate of 1.8 degrees Celsius increase by the end of the century. At the upper end of the scenarios, we get a best estimate of about 4 degrees Celsius. Now, if you look at even the lower number, this combined with the 0 0.74 degree increase that took place during the 20th century represents a total temperature increase of 2.5 degrees plus. Now, that clearly is serious because that is not a small increase. And we must remember that climate change does not consist of smooth and linear changes. I have just mentioned to you the changes in cyclonic activity, on heat waves, droughts and floods. So all of these disturbances in the climate system make the impacts far more serious than purely a projection of temperature increases would indicate. Now what we have shown over here is quite explicit in terms of temperature increases and the kinds of impacts that we are likely to have on water, on ecosystems, on food, on coastal locations, on health. And you would observe that some of the serious impacts start even with low temperature increases, particularly on water. If you look at uh, decreasing water availability and increasing drought in mid-latitudes and semi-arid low latitudes, that is the second line listed under water. Ecosystems, uh, ecosystems would be affected quite uh, seriously and there is enough evidence around the world about movement of species from one location to the other as a result of climate change and this is happening with uh, species that live on land as well as those that are in the oceans. If you go to the Arctic region, some of the species that uh, existed in the somewhat lower latitudes of the Arctic region are now migrating northward simply because temperatures have changed. They can't survive in the revised conditions. So, you know, we are affecting a whole range of uh, life across the planet. Uh, food is another area that is going to be of concern. Coastal locations are particularly vulnerable and human health where vector-borne diseases are on the increase and will continue to increase as a result of climate change. There is also the danger of abrupt or irreversible impacts. For instance, if you had a collapse of the Greenland or West Antarctic ice sheets, either one of them, you will get sea level rise of several meters and that of course would be disastrous for the entire planet because you would really be affecting the geography of this planet. 
There could be hundreds of millions of people that will be affected as a result of an increase of several meters. And there are some islands that will vanish. Early this month, I was in New Zealand uh, for World Environment Day, which is observed in a different location officially each year, and this year was New Zealand's turn. And the president of Kiribati, Kiribati as it's pronounced, was also there on the occasion, and both of us addressed a number of meetings and, and groups. And he emphasized the fact that by the end of this century, all the people in his country, in these, uh, this is an island nation in the Pacific, will have to vacate uh, where they were born, where their ancestors lived. And this, I think, is going to be uh, the reality in several parts of the world. Uh, Low-lying coast, low coastal areas, uh, parts of Bangladesh are extremely vulnerable. Then a number of small island states across the world. Uh, the Maldive Islands, for instance, are barely a meter above sea level in most locations. So uh, even a sea level rise of a few feet would be enough to drive them away from their, their place of birth and where they have been living all these years. So, you know, these, this is really a danger that we must do everything to avoid. Uh, there's also the danger to species, because 20 to 30 percent of the species that we've assessed in the IPCC are likely to be at risk of extinction if increases in warming exceed 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. So this clearly mentioned, clearly indicates the fact that the figure that I mentioned, the lower end of the projections that we have, is clearly unacceptable because that would really provide a threat to species that the human race cannot possibly afford. Um, we also know that there are changes taking place in the Gulf Stream. There's the meridional overturning circulation, and this would have major impacts on marine ecosystem productivity on fisheries, ocean CO2 uptake, and terrestrial vegetation. So we are on a path which could lead to some abrupt and totally irreversible changes. Warming in the western mountains in North America is projected to cause decreased snowpack and reduce summer flows. And this will exacerbate competition for over-allocated water resources. Increased number, intensity, and duration of heat waves will have potential for adverse health impacts. And I'm very happy that in the scoping plan that's been drawn up, health impacts have been highlighted adequately because clearly there is a nexus between climate change and health impacts which we can only ignore at our own peril. Coastal communities and habitats are particularly vulnerable due to stresses induced by climate change, and this will impact on development and pollution. Water resources are going to be uh, uh, very scarce in the future, and we have uh, assessed that uh, water stress by 2020 could affect 120 to 1.2 billion in Asia, 12 to 81 million in Latin America, and 75 to 250 million in Africa. Agriculture would be very seriously affected to the extent of 30% reduction in yields by 2050 in Central and South Asia, 30% by 2080 in Latin America, and 50% by 2020 in some African countries. And do remember uh, the fact that we are going through a food crisis worldwide today. Food prices have gone up, particularly for countries that have very low incomes and spend 70 to 80 percent of their family budgets on food. A doubling of food prices is crippling. They really don't know how to cope with it. And if with the impacts of climate change, yields are going to go down, then we're really adding to the problem of food insecurity. And this is something that cannot leave any part of the world untouched because starvation, famines in this day and age are not confined to specific communities. They will be on your television screens. You will be living with them from morning to evening on all the news channels. And this can create an upheaval that clearly we want to avoid at all costs. Um, now, there are some priorities that are required to manage the problem of climate change, long-term field monitoring is required, uh, which would include regions with sparse data and small islands, 
We need to harmonize scenarios and associated regional changes in climate and vulnerabilities. Because really speaking, in some parts of the world that are most vulnerable, we have a notable lack of information and, of course, a total absence of any research capacity. And this is where I think we need to work with groups all over the world, which would require multidisciplinary and multi-institutional research. Now, let's look at some mitigation targets and costs. Often we are told that, you know, uh, if we indulge in mitigation activities, it's going to cripple the economy, there will be a loss of jobs. But really speaking, there could be nothing further from the truth. We have assessed a whole range of stabilization scenarios, and uh, in the top row over here, you see one, uh, one particular scenario, which would stabilize global mean temperature increase to 2 to 2.4 degrees Celsius. And this would be roughly the level of concentration of gases that we have in the world today. But if we want to stabilize at that level, we have a very short window of opportunity. We would have to ensure that emissions peak no later than 2015. They would have to peak in 2015 and then decline rapidly thereafter. And the more rapidly they decline, the greater the likelihood of avoiding some of the worst impacts of climate change that we may face in the future. Uh, the cost of this is going to be very low. We've assessed that by 2030, the total loss of GDP that's possible as a result of this stringent mitigation scenario would be less than 3% of the global GDP. That's certainly not a high price to pay for avoiding all the terrible impacts that are going to take place, which if you put a dollar value on, will be several times more than the cost of these actions. In real terms, what does that mean? Well, in reality, the cost will be much lower because there are huge co-benefits from mitigation, health co-benefits from reduced air pollution, increased energy security. Surely that's something that would ring a bell to a lot of people across the world today because uh, we are facing uh, energy prices, oil prices in particular, of $140 a barrel, and the outlook for supplies in the future is fraught with uncertainties. Uh, there would be another core benefit in terms of greater rural employment. If you look at the example of Germany, which has really gone aggressively for renewable energy use, it has thrown up a large number of new jobs. It's really created a new economy which didn't exist earlier. So, you know, it really is wrong to believe that there would be a burden as a result of this kind of transformation. There would be enormous benefits. Increased agricultural production. Because if there's going to be a decline in yield, and evidence on that is becoming much stronger every day, then there would be reduced uh, pressure on natural ecosystems as well. So overall, may I say that the 3% GDP cost that I mentioned in 2030 will actually turn out to be much lower. And it could very well turn out to be a negative cost. In other words, it's entirely possible that the world will actually improve and increase its output as a result of this transition. Um, so there are all kinds of no regrets policies and reduced mitigation costs. And one can give umpteen examples of how if we were to change our attitudes and values and were to create the technologies that can make a difference, we would certainly be able to bring about a transition without any additional costs at all. I'll give you one simple example. About four years ago, there was a major meeting organized by the secretary uh, of the DOE in Washington, D.C., the, called the so-called Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum. And I was invited to uh, deliver the keynote address. When I landed in Washington, D.C., you know, uh, given the fact that I have a beard and I come from a part of the world where somebody is hiding in the hills of Afghanistan, uh, it, it, it took me a while to go through immigration and so on. And, you know, by the time I, I came out, it was, uh, fortunately, that doesn't happen anymore. You know, that, again, is a good s sign of the times. When I tell them I'm chairman of the IPCC, the immigration guy says, I wish you all the best. We all thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> Can you imagine? So, anyway, when I came out, there was this guy with a placard waiting to drive me to uh, D.C., and he says, sir, I thought you hadn't come. I said, well, it took a while. 
He says, anyway, I've got a car for you and I'll take you there right away. So we went there, uh, got into the car. The engine was running, the air conditioner was running. And I said, why did you do this? And this must have been about two hours or so because it took me an hour and a half to go through immigration. So I said, why did you do this? He said, I wanted to make sure that you had a comfortable car to sit in. I said, for heaven's sake, I'm going to be uncomfortable throughout the journey now <laughs> because, because the thought bothers me. But, you know, I'm just mentioning this as an indication of how we have been brought up to accept waste all around. And I think if we were to bring about a shift in attitudes, that in itself will have huge benefits. So we've got to look for these so-called low-hanging fruits. And let me run through the rest of my presentation quickly. We've assessed that all the stabilization levels that we have looked at really require technologies that are currently available or expected to be commercialized in coming decades. But we would need incentives to ensure that new technologies and new methods are developed to carry on this program of action. And this is where I think California can lead. Uh, there are all kinds of opportunities in the energy supply sector because 26% of global GHG emissions come from this sector. And this would include a whole range of things uh, which I don't have to go into, including carbon capture and storage. Uh, there are technologies that need to be commercialized, and I think California can lead in this direction. It's certainly leading already, but the, the scope for going further is enormous. You, you need policies and measures to bring about this transition. Uh, transport is another area which, of course, has been highlighted in the scoping plan as well. Um, and I don't want to go into details, but you need a sen second generation of fuels. You need uh, efficiency improvements in automobiles. You need a shift to public transport. And uh, again, we need policies, measures, and instruments which have to be devised very carefully. Uh, buildings are another area. And this also has been included in the scoping plan. Um, and what you see at the bottom of this uh, particular uh, slide is a complex that my institute has in uh, New Delhi, uh, which uses no power from the grid. It's um, constructed in such a way, designed in such a way that the demand for energy is very low. And um, we meet that through photovoltaics, through biomass gasifier, and also from um, uh, something called an earth air tunnel, blowing air four meters below the surface of the air that comes into uh, the living spaces. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time on some of these policies and practices, which you can read on the screen, but I only want, want to highlight changes in lifestyle and management. I make myself very unpopular, particularly in the Nordic countries, when I tell them that you should eat less meat, because the meat cycle is very intensive in carbon dioxide, and I tell them that you would be healthier, and so would the planet. So let's help both parties involved. Uh, what we need is an effective carbon price on signal. And uh, now that we have very high oil prices on oil, uh, high prices on oil, we should make sure that uh, we use that signal for uh, creating uh, new technologies and so on. And finally, let's remember what Chief Seattle said. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. There's no way that we can affect uh, the climate of this planet and remain immune from its impacts. We are part of nature. And if we disrupt the functioning of nature, that certainly is going to disrupt, disrupt our lives as well. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. We do have uh, time for a few questions. I don't know how we can take them from the web. Someone must. But I, you've got a microphone for the room. We'll just take them from the room then. So uh, go ahead. How um, much of a factor is, is the rapid population growth of the Earth in climate change? Um, and if so, uh, why don't you talk about it more, and what should be done about it? Well, population is certainly an important part of uh, the equation. Uh, 
but I'm reminded of uh, a conference that we had organized on population, environment, and development in Washington, D.C. several years ago, and Senator Tim Wirth spoke over there. We'd invited him. And he said, we have a population problem in the U.S. He says, we add 3 million people to our population each year, and each person over here consumes 40 times what a Bangladeshi consumes. So we are adding 120 million to the population of the world each year. So population is important, but I think we should also look at consumption patterns. Uh, now, there are countries like China where you can bring about through mandatory measures a limit on population increase. In other parts of the world, I really think you have to create development opportunities. You have to create education, particularly of the girl child, because that has a major impact on fertility decisions. And I think you also have to make sure that contraception is available, which means good health care services. It's a pity that, you know, there's been a decline in uh, development assistance for some of these programs where contraception, uh, information dissemination was being done quite effectively. And I think uh, we really need a worldwide effort by which we create conditions that would ensure people being able to take fertility decisions that they want to. And uh, certainly, even if you talk to an uneducated woman uh, in a developing country, she doesn't want more than three or four children, particularly now that life expectancy has gone up. Earlier on, that wasn't the case. Uh, but, you know, since they are still uneducated, they are not fully uh, accepted in terms of their rights in society, uh, they don't always get their way. So I think all those reforms are essential. Yes, uh, <coughs> thank you, Dr. Pichuri. Um My question involves the stabilization scenarios you were talking about and as far as the mitigation targets. Um, you, you listed four different time frames based on, uh, you know, what, what needs to actually happen. So my question is, um, do you have a sense of, of which of those time frames uh, is, is most probable uh, given what needs to happen socially, politically, technically, and economically in order to, in order to persi persist in the collaborations to make that happen? I, I think what's emerging now is at least something of a consensus on a mid-century vision, if I may call it that. Most leaders are tending towards defining the kind of reduction as indeed in this state has happened defining the reduction that you would need in emissions by 2050. But I think it's critically important to come up with uh, some ambitious targets for 2020 because unless we do that, uh, then we would only be in a sense looking at something that is so far in the future that it really doesn't translate into action in the immediate short term. So I commend the fact that 2020 is getting the kind of attention that it is. And I think when we've come up with something by way of accomplishment in 2020 or even well before that, one would have to focus on the next decade, that means up to 2030. So it seems to me that what we're dealing with is a rolling scenario as we move along. And my own feeling, and this is just a personal belief, is that these targets are going to get tighter because as you find that the impacts of climate change are turning out to be worse than what one anticipated, there would be a lot of public support and possibly the need for leadership to articulate targets that are much sharper than was thought of earlier. Thank you. Hi. Um, there's an American environmental writer named Bill McKibben who has started a grassroots movement that suggests that the target for the world for parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere should be 350. Um, so that would be a significant reduction from our current level. Do you have a view of that goal? Well, you know, uh, there are several, several scientists who are suggesting that now. Um, and as I said, you'll probably see a tightening of targets over a period of time. You know, um, seven or eight years ago, people were arguing between 450 to 550 parts per million of CO2. Uh, nobody's talking about 550 anymore. Uh, so I think people are now realizing that we really have to bring about a major transition 
to a very low carbon economy. But on the other hand, to be realistic, to come down to 350 is going to take a major effort. I think we'll just have to keep reviewing opportunities and look at developments as they give us greater confidence in moving towards lower targets. And I think that's why it's critically important that we make a quick beginning because that will give us the kind of uh, confidence by which we can do things which may seem unreasonably tough at this point of time. Dr. Pachori, thank you, and uh, welcome to Sacramento. You. Um, as you pointed out, the IPCC itself is 20 years old. Um, can you relate to us the things that have worked, the things that haven't worked, and where do you see the IPCC going in the next 20 years? Well, we are actually in the midst of uh, defining what the IPCC should do in the future. Uh, we are looking at two aspects of the challenge. Firstly, there are some things that have worked very well for the IPCC. The whole set of processes and procedures have given it a certain uh, transparency, a certain level of credibility, which I think is a major asset for the organization. It's also created a kind of a reputation where, frankly, uh, the best of scientists are actually volunteering their time to come and work for the IPCC, which is a good thing. You don't really have to go and knock on somebody's door and say, look, we beg you to get involved. <clears throat> so that's one part of it. The other part is the kind of challenge that the world would impose and the expectations that they would have of us in the future. There is this uh, issue of science moving very rapidly. And we bring out assessments every six years or so. And the next one we have decided will come out in 2014. Uh, the policy community says, look, that's much too long. You please give us an update. Now, the problem is, if we were to provide a formal update, we have to go through the usual procedures of the IPCC, which are, by their very nature, very time-consuming. So we have to find some way by which we can provide at least some kind of a partly formal update of what's happened. That's a major requirement. The other thing that we'll have to do is to make sure that there's a request for a special report, like we're now going to work on a special report on renewable energy, which I think I, I'm very excited about, because I think it will tell the world what renewable energy can really do and under what conditions and circumstances. But there's a demand for a whole lot of other things that we probably have to bring out special reports on. So uh, in that sense, there might be a slight shift in the product mix that we're going to produce. Uh, and let's see how that goes. We also, this is again a personal belief of mine, we'll have to spend a lot more on outreach. I have believed that ever since I became chairman of the IPCC. I said it's not enough to produce good reports and have them sitting on the shelves of people. You've got to get the message out. And I think the scientific community must realize the importance of being able to translate messages in science for the benefit of the public. Unless you do that, I think you're not living up to your responsibility. So I think we'll be doing a lot more of that. But we have to do it in a way that we don't get into being identified as advocacy groups. So we'll have to do it in a manner that's credible, that's objective, and doesn't take positions that are in any way political. They have to be based on science, on socioeconomic reality, and so on. Thank you, Dr. Pachori, for coming today. Um, I was uh, blessed with uh, the chair to be delegate at the uh, conference in Bali. And um, that is sort of a once-in-a-lifetime experience for people who uh, aren't exposed to that world community that meets in that. But in talking to lots of, I mean, the best thing about Bali, for me at least, was the opportunity to meet all these people from throughout the world who are coping with the same issues to reaffirm more than anything else, and it's hard when you're sitting in the United States that this is a world question, and that so many of us who are involved in the world are reaching it at very different levels. But in light of that, and the comment you just made a moment ago about outreach, I was struck particularly with the African delegates that I met about the challenges those nations have to develop the skill levels at their national level to understand and do the research that more than any issue of modern times, this is an issue that we need to be challenged to educate our young people, to get them committed 
to uh, curriculums and and educational programs and your charisma. I saw you walking up and down the halls there prior to Al Gore's speech. You know, meet, meeting all those young people who were sitting there waiting to get in there on the floor, and you were shaking their hand and you were reaffirming your role. I think in the future can be so critical to motivate, to uh, invigorate, and to challenge our young people to look at climate as the issue for them to think about. And so, you know, coming today was wonderful for me to see you again, but also I think your role becomes really important in a much larger sense than just being chair of IPPCC, but also motivating the children of the world to understand it. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's very kind of you. I really appreciate that, and I feel very passionately about speaking to young people because that gives you hope they are receptive. But to address the issue of the lack of capacity in Africa, you know, the IPCC has got this Nobel Prize money which we have shared with uh, uh, former Vice President Al Gore. And what I have proposed to the IPCC is that we build on this fund and we use it for creating capacity in those countries where there is no research capability. We can give good young scientists over there fellowships to go to institutions where they learn something and then go back to their homes and actually give something in terms of knowledge to those societies. So you raised an extremely important issue and I hope we succeed in doing that. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you for coming, uh, Dr. Pachuri. I'm Matt Vanderslice with the Planning and Conservation League. One of the issues that California is wrestling with is how to address land use, um, particularly both to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to uh, incorporate the effects of climate change. Uh, could you give us some pointers on that, uh, particularly on issues of how to incorporate sea level rise into our planning? Thank you. Well, to be quite honest, I don't know enough about the, the specific situation in different parts of California, but clearly there would have to be <coughs> investments in protective measures, protective infrastructure, and that would have to be identified very carefully we would probably need to come up with new zoning laws because you don't want to uh, expose people and property to risk, which certainly will increase with sea level rise in some parts of the state. Uh, there would probably need to be a totally different approach to uh, management of water resources uh, with the scarcity of water that you have in this part uh, of the world. And frankly, we'll have to bring about some changes in lifestyles as well unpopular as that might sound. I mean, when I was a, uh, a child, I remember whenever we bathed, we got a bucket of water and we used to bathe with a bucket of water. Today, everyone just keeps the shower on for 15 or 20 minutes without thinking twice. Now, I just wonder whether in hotels and places like that, every room will have a meter whereby you pay for what you consume. All of that will bring about changes. And you know, these are things that will get lodged in our minds and we'll start adjusting the way we do things. I don't see any great loss of welfare or happiness as a result. We can still be happy with maybe a five minute shower and we'll still, still be st still still be feeling fine and you know smelling all right after that. <laughs> One of my colleagues actually remarked you know in uh, in Valencia where we uh, approved of the synthesis report of the IPCC I went without sleep for about 45 hours. I <clears throat> worked all, we worked all through the night because I was determined to get approval of the summary for policymakers of the synthesis report. We finished at something like 7 in the morning. I went to the hotel, took a shower, all right, <laughs> lay down for a little while and came back and started the meeting again and it carried on till 10.30 at night. So, you know, I didn't really get any sleep for 45 hours, but one of my senior colleagues actually commented when it was all over and we were celebrating. He says, she said that our chairman is quite a character. I was sitting next to him. For one thing, he didn't lose his energy and uh, what's more, he was smelling all right after 45 hours. Of, so. Thank you, doctor, for coming. Uh, I would like to inquire as to whether or not when emission factors are considered for energy production, uh, are, are we also considering the emission factors that occur in the mining, milling, processing, transport, and dealing with waste after the fact as well? Thank you. Absolutely. I think uh, our accounting does include everything, but you know, there are gaps in several parts of the world which need to be made good. And I, uh, 
I think we also have to reorient our thinking to take into account the entire cycle of every production and consumption activity. And that's why I highlighted the issue of eating less meat. If you look at the amount of land that is cleared for grazing purposes and the trees that are often cut down in several countries of the world, the refrigeration throughout the entire cycle and the fact that we all have big freezers in our refrigerators at home these days. Why? Simply because we've got to store large quantities of meat. All of this adds to carbon dioxide emissions. If we brought about a 20% reduction in meat consumption, it, I'm, I'm sure we'll be better off in several respects. Thank you. That was the last question. Uh, I want to thank everyone who attended and all those who listened in. I believe it was taped, so others will be able to listen to it in the future as well. Um, Dr. Pachari, um, we in California think of ourselves as being at the epicenter of the universe, and um, we, we know that we have a wide influence in what we do, but it is not every day that we're visited by a Nobel Prize winner, and we thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you.